Welcome to day 15 of the Sociology Guys 2022 challenge. Each day I look at 20 marks of exam questions for the AQA A-level sociology specification. This week we've been looking at culture and identity. I say this week, it was actually last week, I've already started to fall behind. Um, it's a good reason so like I kind of give myself weekends off really so I can catch up on some of these. Um, but it gives you an idea sort of like of how difficult it is to revise every day. Sometimes you do need a rest day, sometimes you do need to catch up. Things happen in life and, and you fall behind slightly. I'm going to try and catch up today and we're going to look at sort of like some of the questions. First of all, um, we looked at uh, these two questions that were set on Friday. Outline and explain two ways socialization is impacted on the formation of ethnic identities. We'll look at that in a minute. Second question, apply material from item A, analyze two ways in which disability is presented as a stigmatized identity. This type of question, apply and analyze, you always have to refer to the item. You always have to make a reference to the item. Make sure you do. It's signpost to the examiner that you've read the item and that you can pick information from the item and answer a question with it. Let's look at that item. It says disability has a powerful impact on an individual's concept of identity. Both visible and hidden disabilities are often presented negatively with a focus on the limitations that people with disabilities may encounter in their lives. What you've got to do is you've got to pick a couple of hooks out of there. In my answer, what I did is I picked out um, presented negatively and limitations and looked at those as ways in which disability is a stigmatized identity. But we'll come to that in the second part. Um, I send out um, a little bit of a summary each day. You can find them all on my website, sociologyguide.com. If you go under uh, the 2022 challenge, that page, and it gives them all of these out as well, and the model answers. Number of different ways ethnic, minor, ethnic identities are formed. Um, Hyde's looked at the idea that sort of like ethnic identities are formed through primary socialization, through the artifacts, and through the way that people are socialized by their parents. Jacobson found that religion was a form of identity, as did Archer. Archer sort of like found that with um, young British Pakistani males, they identified themselves as Muslim. They also adopted um, different characteristics of African American culture as well, in a response as a response to racism in the education system. The evidence of hybrid identities, looking at Gilroy and Birdsey, um, the idea that diaspora, the idea that people have been forcibly moved from one area to another, but they try to keep the community alive, that also has an impact on their identity. Variation of identities, Hall talked about sort of like how there was a broad range of identities coming out in the UK, and he's writing sort of like in the 70s and 80s. Changing ethnic identities, you look at Madhuda Tal and Bassett, uh, and the idea that sort of like as we move into the second and third generation of people who have migrated to the UK um, in the 50s and 60s, we're starting to see changes um, to ethnic identities and how they're starting to merge a little bit more between an Asian and a British identity. My answers, I looked at um, primary socialization so I'm going to give you my answer here. One way in which socialization is impacted on the formations of ethnic identities is through primary socialization. Ethnic subcultures are more likely to be so, so sorry, ethnic subcultures are more likely to be socialized into the norms and values of the ethnic culture at home through the food they eat, the language they speak and the way they are expected to dress. Hyde's researched various ethnic groups in the UK and found that at home there were many artifacts that acted as cues to the individual's ethnic identity, such as ornaments, pictures, idols and icons. As the role of socialization often falls to the mother and families, Hyde's also found that conformity to the norms and values of ethnic cultures was primarily the mother's role in the family and that food and dress were vitally important in establishing a sense of ethnic heritage. This was particularly the case in Hyde's research in South Asian families, but similar findings have been reported in Caribbean, African and Eastern European households. OK, so I start out by making my point. It's primary socialization that does it. I explain briefly how primary socialization does it. I add in a bit of research with Hyde's research there. And then I finish off by linking back to sort of like how it forms ethnic identity. Second response, a uh, second way in which socialization has formed ethnic identities is through agencies of secondary socialization. OK. We've gone with primary socialization for one, we're going with secondary socialization for another. The question asks the ways socialization is impacted. So you've got primary and secondary socialization. You could also go on re-socialization, but with ethnic identity, it's more likely to be primary or secondary. 
Whilst these agencies often promote the values of the UK into a wide range of ethnic groups, they help to develop hybrid identities. Gilroy examined Black Caribbean cultures and found that elements of white culture had merged with more traditional Black Caribbean cultures to develop new forms of identity. Similarly, Bassett found that among South Asian schoolgirls, education had led to, led, to, <laughs> led to them adopting hybrid identities. These identities retained many of the core values from the students' ethnic backgrounds, such as language, religion and dress, but also adopted Western values of ambition and gender equality. And furthermore, Maduda Al found that younger generations of Asians had drifted away from some traditions of, of the ethnic culture, but were politically and socially aware of the importance of identifying with their ethnic backgrounds, forming a British Asian hybrid identity. OK, so I'll put three pieces of research in there, three very small kind of um, excerpts from pieces of research in there to talk about the breadth. You could probably easily pull one of those out and come up with a really good response. The idea would be is that agents of secondary socialization, education, the media, they will influence um, the development of ethnic identities, particularly in second and third generation um, migrants into the UK. Our next question was looking at disability and how disability is seen as a stigmatized identity. A few bits of research that I found here. Shakespeare talks about the negative labeling of disability and how it develops this social construction of people being helpless if they have a disability. They're viewing people as, a, as disabled rather than viewing people as having an impairment. Scott also mentioned this, um, talking about negative labeling of, li of blind people and how this developed into a learned, help a learned helplessness. Uh, as people um, internalise the label and it became a self-fulfilling prophecy. You can look at some of the media stereotypes. So Cumberbatch at Al and Barnes both found that uh, disabled people were negatively labelled within um, the media. And But we have to also sort of like say that this is changing somewhat in society. Still, it's not equal. It's nowhere near equal. But we're starting to see some more positive representations of people with visible and invisible disabilities or impairments um, within the UK media. So here was our question, analyze two ways in which disability is presented as stigmatized identity. I mentioned at the start of the video, what I did is I talked about presented negatively, which kind of leads me into the media and the limitations that people with disabilities may account, that leads me to link to labeling. So here's my answer. One way in which disability is seen as a stigmatized identity is how individuals are presented negatively, item A. There you go, there's my big signpost to the examiner that I've used the item, I know what I'm talking about, I'm going to make the link here. This is most likely to be seen in media portrayals of individuals with disabilities whose disability is often seen as being central to their character in fictional works or used as a personal story and factual representations. Cumberbatch et al. found that there was little representation of disability in mainstream media and where there was, the individual's disability formed a central part of their storyline, such as how they overcame adversity or detailing the struggles that they faced. Furthermore, Barnes found, uh, sorry, furthermore, Barnes found that in media sources, disabled people were often represented as being dependent upon others or embittered by their disability and cast as villainous. However, in contemporary media sources, this is changing with the normalization of conditions rather than the labeling of characters as disabled. The second paragraph, a second way in which disability is presented as a stigmatized identity is through the discussion of the limitations. Item A, there's my signpost, people with impairments face. It's argued that individuals with visible impairments are often labeled as disabled and this becomes a master status for that person that overrides all other characteristics that the person possesses. Shakespeare found that many people with impairments were viewed through this negative label and that their impairment was less of a burden to them than the label of being seen as disabled. Furthermore, Scott argues that this form of labeling of people as being disabled leads to a sense of learned helplessness whereby the pity they receive from others is internalized and becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, one which ultimately leads to the individual becoming dependent upon others for assistance. The same kind of labeling um, that we see um, throughout society, whenever we talk about labeling, it works the same way. People have to internalize that for some reason they need help and therefore they start to rely upon other people as needing help. 
And to finish this off, this results in disability being stigmatized. There's my link back to the question. As being dependent upon others rather than an impairment that individuals can and often do overcome. Okay, so that finishes culture and identity and what a weak culture and identity was. That's probably the toughest part of the section so far, although I'm doing health next week, which will probably be a little bit tougher. We're now moving on to families and households. Families and households, lots of students do this. About 90% of students do families and households. I put two questions up here. We're starting with outline and explain two ways changes to household structures may impact on childhood experience. So you'll make a link from the specification point that looks at household structures to childhood. How might changes to household structures impact on childhood experience? So just a few to kind of throw out there. Um, beanpole families, how might um, the involvement of grandparents in children's lives have a greater experience? How might changes to households such as lone parent families, how might reconstituted families, how might that impact on a child's experience? Question two, applying material from item A, analyse two reasons for the decline in marriage in contemporary society. Straightforward question, made a little bit more difficult by the fact that you've got to pull information from the item. The item here is item A, in recent years, there's been a decline in the number of marriages. Sociologists have argued that these changes are the result of people's greater individualism and their lack of belief in social institutions. Couple of things should spring out to you there. Lack of belief in social institutions uh, kind of hints at a process called secularization. So that could be a reason why there's a decline in marriage. The result of people's greater individualism, people have more choice. People might choose not to get married. People might choose to get married later in life. People might choose to have same sex relationships. People may choose lots of different lifestyles. OK, and that's one of the reasons why we've got a decline in marriage. People may cohabit instead of getting married. They may not believe in marriage as a social institution. There's another link that you could have. OK, so. I'm running a day behind. Hopefully this will be out. Um, hopefully day 16 will be out very, very shortly. Um, and hopefully you're playing along with me. If you've been doing cultural and identity, I'm not quite sure where you would do families and households. But at the same time, um, I hope you do um, take part. And thanks for watching.